Hey guys, it's Unch here with another Tech Talk. I want you guys to look around your room right now. From your phone, to your thermostat, to your smart fridge. Devices around us are all becoming smarter and smarter. Thus today, we're diving into the technology making all that possible. 5G and the internet of things. We're not just building smarter phones or faster Wi-Fi. We're laying the groundwork for something way bigger. A fully reactive world where the infrastructure itself is intelligent, where roads talk to cars, machines predict their own failures, and your devices respond before you even ask. That's what 5G and IoT are really about. And honestly, I think most people don't realize how big this is. So today, I want to break it all down. Not just what these technologies do, but how they actually work under the hood and what I think they mean for the way we live. I think it's crazy how fast we're really moving, but we should also be a bit scared as well. So let's talk about the tech involved in 5G. Everyone talks about 5G being fast. But the speed isn't the most interesting part. It's how 5G is built differently from the ground up. Unlike 4G, which is mostly centralized, 5G is distributed and virtualized. It doesn't just blast signals from one big tower. It uses small cells, edge servers, and smart routing. And then there's network slicing. This part honestly blows my mind. Telecom providers can split one physical 5G network into multiple different virtual networks, each optimized for something different. Imagine one slice is built for self-driving cars, another is for massive IoT deployments, and another one might be for high-definition videos. It's like one road with separate lanes for an ambulance, truck, or bike. And each one moves differently, but smoothly, making it extremely efficient. There's also NSA versus SA. Early 5G mostly runs on top of 4G. That's NSA. It's like upgrading your house, but still using the old foundation. It's faster, but not transformative. And then there's standalone 5G. That's when the full power comes in. Lower latency, which means lower delay from an action in the network. Better reliability and the real ability to slice, scale, and virtualize the network. Personally, I think until we see full SA rollouts, we're only the scratching the surface of what 5G can really do. Another piece I think is underrated is how 5G ties in with edge computing. Instead of sending your data to the cloud, like a massive data center miles away, edge computing puts mini data centers near the towers. So for stuff like real-time gaming, autonomous robots, AR headsets, you don't have to wait on the cloud. The processing happens close to you and fast. This is what makes one millisecond latency possible. For me, this part is personal. I've always hated lag, whether I'm gaming on Fortnite or editing something in the cloud. With edge computing and 5G, those delays could disappear entirely. 5G also uses a wider range of radio frequencies, which each have a trade-off. There's the low band, which have longer range, greater coverage, but slower speeds. There's the mid band, which is a balanced coverage and speed. This is what most carriers use right now. And then there's the high band, which is insanely fast but has super short range and can get blocked by trees, or walls, or even your hand. To make this work, 5G uses tech like beam forming. This is instead of sending signals everywhere, the tower focus of, focuses a beam directly at your device. There's also massive MIMO, which has multiple antennas sending multiple streams simultaneously more speed and better handling of dense crowds. It's like turning a flashlight into a laser point and then duplicating it a hundred times. Additionally, 6G research is already underway. It's still early, but we're talking about enabling real-time holograms, integrated sensing and communication, and sub-millisecond latency at scale. Alright, now I'll break down the IoT architecture down in four simple layers. And I'll provide a real life scenario for each step. Let's say you run a car manufacturing plant and you want to make sure your machines don't break down unexpectedly because every minute of downtime 
equals money lost. So you install an IoT-based predictive maintenance system. In the first layer, there's the sensors. These are your eyes and ears. These sensors usually have tiny chips called MCUs. Think of them like the mini brains of each device. So as for our car plant, each robotic arm or assembly line machine has vibration sensors attached to it. These different sen sensors measure vibration levels, motor temperatures, and operating speeds. In the second layer is the network layer. That data needs to go somewhere, so it's transmitted using low power protocols like NB-IoT for remote sensors, LoRaWAN for long range, or BLE for short range. If the car plant is a large facility, it may use LoRaWAN for long range, low power, but if the machines are close together, it may use Zigbee or Bluetooth low energy. And the third layer is the edge layer. Here's where local mini computers do fast analysis. Instead of sending all data to the cloud, edge devices filter it. The data might arrive at a local edge gateway, like a Raspberry Pi or industrial PC sitting right there in the factory. It has a tiny AI model trained to detect anomalies. And let's say it notices that one of the motors is vibrating 12% more than normal, which is a possible early sign of failure. So instead of sending all the raw sensor data to the cloud every second, it just sends motor 7 is showing abnormal behavior, suggest inspection within 48 hours. By saying that and not sending it to the cloud, it directly reduces bandwidth, cloud cost, and time. In the fourth and final layer is the cloud layer. This is the long term brain. It aggregates data across thousands of sensors, trains machine learning models, feeds dashboards, and gives you insight you'd never spot on your own. It helps companies see trends over years. So let's say at the end of a hard working day in the car plant, summaries from all machines are uploaded to the cloud. And maybe it learns that what motors from one particular supplier always start to fail after 13,000 cycles, and that it's time to switch suppliers. That would save us millions long term. And so I love this structure layer design because each component has its own function, balancing efficiency, intelligence, and speed. And that's what makes things like smart factories, autonomous farming, and real-time health monitoring actually possible. What really strikes me is how this mirrors the way our own nervous system works. Sensors like our skin collect input, local nerves make quick decisions, and the brain handles complex thought. It's like we're giving machines their own nervous systems. So how will this tech restructure our society? This is what I'm most excited and nervous about. With 5G and IoT, cities become programmable environments. This includes smart traffic that reacts to flow in real time, water and energy systems that auto-balance to save resources, public safety drones, sensors and bridges, and responsive streetlights. But here's the tricky part. Whoever controls that infrastructure controls a lot more than just technology. If Google runs your smart grid or traffic system, they influence how your entire city functions. As someone who's always been fascinated by smart cities, I also wonder, will they actually serve everyone equally? Or will it be like the internet? Powerful for some, inaccessible for others. In the industrial world, this tech flips the script. You've got robots coordinating over private 5G networks, digital twins of entire production floors, and predictive algorithms that prevent breakdowns before they happen. That's amazing, but also a little unnerving. Supply chains could start rerouting themselves without human input. Jobs we rely on could vanish before we figure out what comes next. So are we building for speed? Or are we building for people? And while there is the good of more efficient everything, transport, medicine, energy, cleaner cities and more responsive services, safer roads, faster emergency responses, even remote surgeries, there's also the risk of if everything is connected, everything is hackable. From hospitals to water grids, data collection at scale, is surveillance risk, especially if transparency is lacking. 
the risk of being tracked 24-7, wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you buy, all logged and analyzed. And there could be a potential abuse of that data by corporations or governments without proper oversight. And rural areas might get left behind in this race towards smarter everything. And this is where I think we need to be careful. Just because we can connect everything doesn't mean we should. At least not without serious thoughts about ethics, access, and transparency. And so I think, are we building a smarter world? Or are we building a more fragile one? And this tech is powerful, but it's not neutral. It reflects the values of the people building it. So as we step into this new world, we have to ask, who gets access? Who gets control? And how do we make sure this future works for everyone, not just the few? Thanks for tuning in. If this episode got you thinking, hit that like button, share it with a friend, and follow for more deep dives into the tech that's quietly reshaping our world. I'll be watching where this goes. And I hope you'll be right there with me.